As someone that had a Jesuit education, I've been particularly interested um, in hearing uh, the next uh, reading from Blood and Beauty, um, which is uh, about the, the Borgias, a uh, fascinating family. Um, the only sort of family that make a, a Sikh family around marriage time seem dull. Um, <laughs> Less poisoning, but a lot more dancing in the Sikh families. Um, reading from her novel, please welcome Sarah Dinant. I'll speak to you later about what's fact and what's fiction. Um, it is a historical fact that when Rodrigo Borgia took over the papacy in 1492 to become Alexander VI, he had a 17-year-old mistress. It is also a historical fact that she was known for having very remarkable hair. What follows, though, is an act of the imagination. The first time Rodrigo Borgia had taken the young Julia Farnese to his bed, she had stood nervously in front of him, clothed only in her hair, her breasts peeking out from the sweeping golden curtain. How could a man resist? The Pope's mistress's hair, such a rich topic for gossip. And why not? When holy men lived on the top of columns to worship the Lord, the length of their hair was proof of their devotion. For Mary Magdalene, it was the cloak that covered her shame and the cloth she used to dry the tears that washed our Savior's feet. For Julia Farnese, though, it has always been the key to glory. At her birth, the midwives had been astonished when cleaning the blood slime from her head, a set of damp, dark curls had sprung forth. By the age of one, they had ripened into a yellow harvest, snaking around her ears. By three, the locks were on her shoulders. By seven, halfway down her back. When had they realized it was to be her fortune? Certainly, the household was enthralled to its demands early, the washing, the lightening, the oiling, the rinsing, the drying, and the brushing, the endless, endless brushing. While her brothers learned Latin and practiced jousting, she sat immobile, her neck muscles braced against the force of the brush, unable to read, unable to sew, unable to do anything but study the weave of the dress in her lap. By the time she started to bleed, her hair, this seventh veil, this river in spate, this golden shroud was down to her knees, and the news of it and her beauty was no longer confined to the house. You are not to be alarmed. The first time it had been brute winter, and he had warmed his hands before so that his touch would not shock. I will do nothing to hurt you. Later, he had arranged her locks across the pillows like a giant sunburst pulsing out from her head, and later still, he had coaxed her into riding on top of him and letting it fall and sweep over his chest and face. In all of this, he was a courteous and fulsome lover, delighting so much in his own delight that it had been impossible to be frightened of him. Yet she had been afraid, not just of her power, because by now she had some understanding of that, but because this silky wonder that she carried with her would only stay perfect when left alone. Once the sweat and suck of skins took over, it began to snag and tangle. Then there were moments when he would roll onto it and her head would be caught by his weight. Of course, she could not cry out, for it was her and she was it, and together they were his mermaid and his Venus and his very own Mary. After the first few encounters, the daytime house rang out with the sounds of her yelps. By now, the matting and tangling had set fast, and however gently the house slave pulled, however wide the tooth comb was used, Julia could not stop herself from crying, so that after a while, neither she nor they were sure if it was her hair or her life that she was weeping over, for so much had changed in so short a time. In the end, she had had to tell him, he had been surprisingly understanding, her desire to please was touching, and truth be told, he too had been finding it somewhat tiresome, negotiating this third lover in the bed. <laughs> Together, they agreed to its imprisonment. From then on, when they made love, it was held inside a heavy rope plait. Now, as he entered her, he scooped it up and looped it once, then twice, around her neck like a heavy gold necklace or a noose. 
And she, because she was a fast learner, threw back her head and groaned as if he was indeed strangling her and the experience was exciting as it was fearful. Three years on, Rodrigo Borgia is now Pope Alexander VI and his drive for constant copulation has lessened a little so that now there are moments when that weight of hair encased in a fat silken neck is as much a pillow as a sex aid as he buries his face or nuzzles, yes, nuzzles, no other word will do for even so great a man, into it. What comfort she brings him. Sometimes after they have mated, he will put his head between her breasts and rests until his breathing moves into a heavy snore while she lies caressing his ox shoulders with their sprinkling of coarse, dark hair. Only when she is sure he is deep asleep, she gently but firmly pushes him off, for she cannot breathe properly when his dead weight is upon her. It is an onerous business running Christendom, and though this aging man is famed for his wondrous stamina in the world at large, it is not always so when it comes to bed, and this too she has grown to understand. He still strives to give her pleasure in the way he uses his fingers to play with her, parting her pubic hair and slipping and hooking deep into the back of her, which to her surprise can make her breathless in a way she does not need to pretend. And how he smiles then. Because for all his grandiose power, Alexander is a man who likes as well as loves women. And it is very important to him that they like him too.